How much can you learn from two minutes of Starship video? I mean, why is this labeled the peninsula? What's on all those screens? Where's this drone shot from? Did any heat tiles fall off? Even if you're already a hardcore Starship fan, I challenge you, get to the end of this video, and if you haven't learned something new about Starbase, tell me down in the comments. I'm John Galloway with NSF. Let's see what we can learn. Now, just so you know, there's gonna be a lot of pausing and rewinding in this because it's a two minute video from SpaceX and there's a lot in every little piece of it to explain. So bear with me. The first shot we get is this drone shot from the south. And you can tell it's from the south. The Gulf of Mexico is over on the right hand side. Way off in the distance, actually, you can see South Padre Island, which is where the majority of the public watched from. Those buildings in the background are actually about six miles away, and folks were able to watch from about one mile closer. Down there at Isla Blanca Park, you could be about five miles away from the orbital launch mount, but that's uh, South Padre Island up to the north. Of course, you can see here the orbital tank farm and the orbital launch mount. I know that I'm looking at it from the south because the tank farm is on the right-hand side and the rocket and the launch mount are on the left-hand side. With the, the suborbital farm is actually all the way over here. And one more interesting thing that you can actually see in this intro drone shot is one of NSF's camera sites. Our south camera site is visible just over here. We got some sun glinting off the solar panels in that direction. I mean, I'm sort of proud of it because it's one of our off-grid, unattended robotic camera sites, all solar powered, stores the energy and batteries. We can log into it remotely. There's a Starlink dish out there. I don't know that you can see it in this. And our site is about 1.2 miles away from the launch mount. So that means the SpaceX drone is probably a mile and a half to two miles away. The mouth of the Rio Grande River and the border with Mexico is 2.7 miles away. So SpaceX was somewhere in that zone, I'd guess around two and a half miles or something like that. Anyways, interesting stuff in the first two seconds. So the next thing we go into is this drone shot. And SpaceX sort of has a leg up on everybody else there because they're the only ones that can operate drones this close to the rocket for good reason. But look at this. This is actually coming from sort of the beach side, the Gulf of Mexico goes behind you. You can actually see off in the distance, this is the production site where they actually build the rockets, stack the reins, etc, etc. And then just along this, this is Highway 4. So if you're driving out there to the beach, it's not actually the water, that's water next to Highway 4 that has the reflection of the sky on it, but the road goes right along that water. We refer to that as the reflecting pool when sometimes you get those awesome reflecting shots. And then we go over to this interesting release behind the scenes information where SpaceX has shown a multi-view probably in mission control right over at the Astra school I like it because I have screens all over me that look like this with all of our cameras right but check this out there's something labeled webcast tower top and of course it makes sense the webcast tower top is on the tower somewhere near the top looking at the starship with the beach and the end of highway 4 in the background again this is highway 4 that sort of goes up this way and you have the beach and the Gulf of Mexico in the background you also get another angle over here in this other main view, I guess, the big box view. It says webcast NT-800. This one looks like it's coming from over near the tank farm and looking at the side of the tower, the rocket and an angle. I looked, I Googled this NT-800 and the only result that came up on NT-800 was an explosion proof, air quotes, intrinsically safe camera. Intrinsically safe is also interesting because you think about this and they've got Volatile gases being vented, right? Methane, primarily methane, volatile gases. And you can't just go down and have your little Raspberry Pi like wired into a thing that you made yourself out of solder because it's possible that your homebrew device may cause a spark. And if you have an environment where methane is mixed in the atmosphere and you have this explosive gas mixture, you don't want to use electronics that could potentially set it off. So there are some devices that are certified intrinsically safe, and that means that they are... I was going to say guaranteed, they are tested to not be a hazard when you're in an environment like that. So long story short, it led me down this rabbit hole about explosion proof, intrinsically safe. And I thought that it was interesting to think that you don't just throw every random camera out there. Moving right along. We've got another one down here labeled OTS Spotter. Not exactly sure what OTS means, but this one looks like it's coming from the uh, production site, right? I'm, somebody tell me what they think OTS means down in the comments. But you can see the tower is between the camera and the rocket here, meaning it's coming back from sort of it's the west back towards Brownsville, right? 
And then you've got two cameras that look like they're very similar angles, just different zoom levels and I guess tilt levels, right? So you've got uh, Webcast Stage 2 and Webcast Peninsula. The Peninsula name actually sort of gives us a hint as to where that may be. If you look on the gulf side of the launch mount, right, there's this little jut of raised terrain that sort of sticks out over here from the from the tank farm. And we actually spotted cameras there in the aftermath. Here's a camera that seems to have survived. Even the huge chunk of concrete they poured for it is still good to go down below it, but the, the wiring doesn't look like it's in great shape. <laughs> Right. Now, the peninsula is interesting. It looks like it's part of an old raised uh, roadbed or rail bed. I know there used to be a railway that would carry supplies from an old dock down south of where the current launch mount is. All got washed away in hurricanes a long time ago, never rebuilt. But you can actually see it in these satellite photos where there's a seemingly different patch of terrain that's developed. It's a straight line. You don't see that a lot of times in nature. Anyways, probably need to do some more research on the history of that, but it's interesting. That's probably where the Peninsula and Webcast Stage 2 were coming from. You've got another one over here called Webcast Wide. Once again, you can see that the uh, launch mount itself is between you and the rocket, just giving that wide view of the rising sun in the background and, and that sort of thing. Moving right along, you've got Webcast Site Wide, and this seems to be looking from the launch site back towards the production site. I guess on occasion you needed a camera or just like back where they were built or you know whatever they were saying during the webcasts. So next up, we've actually got some named cameras where they give us a little bit more information to dig into if you're interested in that sort of thing, right? But you've got OTS2 Komodo. Now, Komodo is the I guess, name of a red digital cinema camera, and I'm really wondering if this wasn't on some sort of remote-controlled PTZ mount. So it's currently looking at uh, the top of the oxygen tank on the booster, right? You, you can see because you've got those external reinforcements around the outside of the tank, and there's ice above it. If that was the ship, there wouldn't be ice there. So this is the sort of interface between the oxygen tank on the booster and the methane tank on the booster. There's methane in the bottom of the methane tank, which is the top of the screen here. And then the oxygen tank is not fully filled up yet, so you don't see ice on the main part of it. Either way, interesting on OTS2 Komodo. Next one over, you've got OTS2 Ursa. This actually may be from a Blackmagic cinema camera line, and it's looking sort of from the peninsula angle, so maybe three cameras out in that basic area. And then the last one actually seems to be an interesting engineering camera. OT88 QD arm is right there, and that looks like it's mounted on the QD arm or the tower right near the QD arm, looking at where the quick disconnect QD, right? Quick disconnect arm attaches to the bottom of the starship, and that's how they put propellants into the starship, right? And then before launch, that disconnects and the arm swings out of the way so that it doesn't get ripped off the tower by the rocket or roasted by the raptors. <laughs> Who are we kidding? The raptors roasted everything that day, but that's okay. <laughs> the idea was that it would swing out of the way. I don't mean to dwell on the camera angles too much and the naming of them, but we have similar screens where we have all our cameras. SpaceX just beats us at that competition because they get to put their cameras, like, you know, on the tower itself. We're here if you need more cameras on the tower, SpaceX. Anyways, moving right along. Now, real quick, this looks like it was shot well before the other shots we've already seen in this video because it's dark outside. You can see the windows in the background and the cameras as well, but it's dark. Nah, that's fine. They took a shot from earlier before the sun actually came up and they put it here for cinematic storytelling purposes. But look at this. There's lots more that we can see in this shot. Up on the wall screens, you can see there seem to be internal shots of Starship. Some of these round sections that we have, that one actually looks like it might be an internal tank shot, which we've seen very, very rarely on webcast. Falcon 9 has had this internal tank camera, but it looks like they had one here, among some other stuff that they didn't share with us. Way back there in the corner, that looks like a trajectory map. You can see it sort of threading the needle between the Florida Keys and Cuba. That red-ish line is where Starship was supposed to fly. Interesting. Also, let me point this out. We talk about this on the webcasts all the time, but we're saying, you know, all these sensors that are being tracked, all the different things that have to go right on the rocket, all the, the little valves and pressures and everything that has to be just right or within family, the nominal numbers, in order for the rocket to actually take off. That's what all these screens are. You can see flow diagrams, you can see graphs that seem to indicate uh, pressures, voltages, temperatures, all sorts of control statuses, I would guess, but all the things that all these people are looking at on these screens are what we mean when we say that there are 10,000 things, 100,000 things, just myriad things that have to go right for the rocket to actually take off. 
All right, real quick, you can actually find these chairs on Amazon. <laughs> I recognize them because we have one of these chairs in our house. But uh, as soon as I saw them in the video, I was like, wait a second, that looks familiar. And sure enough, maybe it's not the exact chair because you can find the same design over and over again with different names stamped on it. But uh, anyways, we'll put a link down below if you want to act like you're in SpaceX Mission Control. Next up, we end over at the public viewing location. This is actually the crowds watching from Isla Blanca Park at South Padre Island. If you look at the map, this is the area where the public could be about five miles away from the launch mount. Now, this is interesting because compared to Cape Canaveral, right? If you're at Cape Canaveral and you're watching a Falcon launch from 39A, right? If you're in Titusville, you're about 12 miles away. And if you go down to 401, sort of the southern viewing angle from there, that's 13 miles away from 39A. So Starship, way bigger rocket, people watching from five miles away. I don't need to compare and contrast it too much because we could do an entire video on how you watch from the Cape or whatever. Maybe we should, actually, it's on the list. Oh, here we go. God, SpaceX, these drone shots, though. Uh, here's another drone shot flying around the partially filled ship and booster. But look at this. Remember earlier when we mentioned the Peninsula camera? If you look down here at the bottom, you can actually see this is the concrete pad that had that camera we think might be the Peninsula camera on it. Down here at the end of Highway 4 is where people always get stuck in their rental cars because they think that they can drive on the sand and they shouldn't. Quick run through mission control. Can we launch it if these two engines are dead? I don't know, everybody's staring at one monitor, seemingly making some sort of decision. Back over to the public viewing area again, and here we go. All right, remember what I said at the beginning? You can tell you're on the south side of the launch pad because you've got the tank farm to the right and you've got the rocket stack to the left. This looks like SpaceX's viewing site somewhere over two miles to the south. You can see they also have a Starlink here in frame. That actually looks like one of the business terminals, the wider square ones instead of the narrower square ones. Got lots of different cameras just on regular tripods here, but look at this. <laughs> this thing looks like a crew served uh, camera platform over here. That looks like a big beefy tracking camera with a long lens on it. Hopefully we got some great shots from that of the launch. Anyways, I hope they put on their bug spray out there, believe me. As soon as you start to walk through that high grass, the mosquitoes arise. God, the drone shots, though. Can you imagine NASA releasing a shot like this? Uh, yeah, we're about to launch to the space station, but uh, let's just let us get one more shot from the nose cone of the Dragon capsule. That's not going to happen. But interesting things to see here. Again, the chopsticks are in the open position, venting all around. But look at the heat tiles. Don't see really any missing that I can point out. Maybe something right here. A couple uh, interesting gaps. And we've sort of talked about that at length. Are they an issue or not? If you get plasma flow in between those gaps, does it rip off a tile or not? Over here, there's some white areas. And are those white areas places where tiles actually took a little bit of a nick? These tiles, they're actually white. Underneath, they're white, and they have this sort of dark black coating on the top of them. But if you, you hit one, like say you were to tap it with a screwdriver or something like that, and scratch a little piece off, it's white underneath. So here, if you see parts that are bright white, it's indicative of damage to the tiles. Is it that big of a deal? I mean, in this flight, it wasn't that big of a deal, but it's something that SpaceX needs to get more data on. So when we went over in our other big video, what SpaceX learned, you know that they got a lot of good information on how the tiles, if not re-entered, survived the stresses of launch, breaking the sound barrier, whatever max Q they got to, etc., etc. Jeez, it's just a cool shot. Thank you, SpaceX drone operators, for real. And here, once again, from the south perspective, you get ignition. I mean, look at this. The shock of the Raptors igniting shakes the ice that's formed on the outside of the rocket, and you get this sort of cascade falling down the side. Back to the South Padre side, this was one of the craziest things about watching this launch in person. It just seemed like it took forever. Is this thing going to go? Are they going to shut down the engines? What's happening? And eventually, you see it start to move. Here we go. So once again, back at the top of the tower, not only is Starship going up, in this initial shot, you can already see something seemingly flying through the air. I mean, look at this. Is this the first bit of concrete to make it that high? It almost looks like it's fluttering or tumbling. Is it a piece of insulation or something like that? Again, it's the unbridled force of the world's most powerful rocket kicking things up taller than the rocket itself. It's crazy to see. Now, I'm going to keep looking for those things simply because I'm very interested in the pad damage, the concrete that was ejected up around, and did it impact the flight at all? 
God, look at the look at the shake of the camera. Just, can you imagine the sound environment here? I would not want to watch from here. Put a camera here though. <laughs> okay, so the first thing you see back at Mission Control are the windows vibrating. Look at this. <laughs> These big panes of glass, easier to see through, picking up a lot of vibrations from the sound of the rocket. But the physics nerd in me says, wait a second. All right, look, on the map, their mission control over here behind the Ad Astra school is about six miles away. The speed of sound at sea level varies with temperature, but the rough speed of sound at sea level is about five seconds to go one mile. So to go six miles, it would be 30 seconds. If this is first motion from the ship, the sound hasn't reached them here yet. A little bit of editing happening here. It's okay. It's okay. It's a cool highlight reel. A couple quick things in the background too, real quick. Uh, I would really love to know what these lines are. Looks like they've got some some gauges, like speedometer tile gauges on the left hand side and then a, a line graph. They're tracking something. Is it real time? Because you see how this one line sort of like ends not quite halfway across the stream. I don't know, but I think I like seeing stuff like that. And then also look at this. Some cameras already get knocked out. We've got color bars over there. Maybe it was intentionally turned off. Maybe the camera has already lost signal. We know that more than one cameras did not make it through the launch. Uh, and here we get the boss. We get Elon pulling an Elon. You remember the Falcon Heavy footage where he's like taking off his headset and running outside to look at the sky with his own eyes and see what's happening. Same sort of thing. Like, I can't say I wouldn't do it too. And look at this amazing shot from the tower as the entire rocket goes past the camera. Just a massive amount of concrete debris. Now, is there a little bit of a depth perception thing going on here? But this is what was up at the nose of the rocket, and there are chunks of concrete flying up to this level. I mean, remember, I, I did this in my backyard with a pressure washer to sort of see how the physics, how the trajectory of the, the debris gets ejected from the stream of pressure hitting a concrete pad. At the end of the day, it's just an amazing shot of the world's most powerful rocket taking off. But the other really interesting thing that you can see from this angle specifically is the slide off the pad. Remember, we explored in the other video the exact forces and guidance control and thrust vectoring that resulted in that motion. We actually demonstrated it in KSP, but in this really clear shot, you can see the right side of the pad starts to get covered, occluded, blocked by the rocket, and you can see more of the left side of the pad as Starship and Super Heavy sort of slide off the pad in that northeastern sort of direction. All right, time out. You may have noticed that the beginning of this video didn't have a, this video is sponsored by whatever, but we still got to pay the bills. So instead of a sponsored slot, how about a quick story? So sometimes we get awesome photos from all the NSF photographers that don't necessarily print well, but I saw one that I really wanted to have a print of. Now, the shop team told me that it was too low resolution, it wasn't going to print right, it wasn't going to look right, and I said, I don't care, send me one anyways and I'll see what it's like. So I ended up with this. Check it out. It's actually a Falcon Heavy in the background and a lightning strike hitting. Now, one of Max's remote cameras actually captured this, and if you look at the raw photo, it's totally white. But Max was able to process it and get this lightning bolt shot and a little bit of resolution on the Falcon Heavy in the background out there at 39A. Now, it's a total aesthetic mood sort of thing, but I <laughs> demanded they put it in the shop. For real, when it prints, it's a very grainy, I mean, it's a photo of a lightning bolt striking. But if that fits the aesthetic for your house or office or room, whatever, you can check it out. Head on over shop.nasaspaceflight.com, buy it. I mean, really, the more people who buy the lightning bolt print, the more it's like, see, I told you they would like it. Just don't flood the shop help desk with, why is this print so grainy? I mean, you were warned. I think it's awesome. <laughs> Anyways, one way to support what we do, including videos like this, without the, this video sponsored by. Let's get back to it. Now, here we go. This is another shot we already used in the other video. We were talking about the engines that were out, but you can see one engine in the center triumvirate or whatever you want to call it. And then one visible engine in the outer ring. Based on the webcast telemetry, it looked like it was two engines in the outer ring there. But this footage we've seen before, so keep going. Ah, and we get our first on rocket camera shot here. So let's locate where this is, right? This big structure you see sticking off the side, that's actually the lifting pin sort of like two little ears on either side of the booster that they use to lift it up with the chopsticks. And you can tell it's the booster because as we move a couple more frames forward here, you can see the grid fin over here as well. Really cool though, on camera rocket footage, gotta love it. We have liftoff and the crowd goes wild. When, when it first lit, you could see people were sort of hesitant to raise their hands, but after it's well clear of the tower, everybody is sort of cheering. 
And here we get our first shot of the folks back at Hawthorne. This view is actually looking underneath the uh, cafeteria in the Hawthorne production facility, but cheers all around from the folks out there at Hawthorne. <laughs> And here we get more on rocket footage. Again, this one looks like it's on Starship. And this is from further up the stack. Given the distance away from the body of the rocket, this is on the forward flap looking down the rest of the stack. It's such a cool shot. I mean, you can see the two grid fins here on Super Heavy Booster. There's the aft flap and just the entire stack, the plumes of exhaust billowing out in all directions because there was no flame trench. Now, another really interesting thing that you can see from this camera is the status of the heat tiles, the TPS, the thermal protection system, right? Watch right here, and it seems that coming from this side of the rocket, this isn't ice falling off of the rocket. This looks like the failure of some heat tiles falling off the side. So a couple things lead me to believe those are heat tiles, right? The, the ice is on the other side of the rocket, but the heat tiles underneath are white. They have a black coating on one side and they're white underneath. And you can see right here, these pieces that are tumbling seem to flip white, black, white, black, white, black, as if it was a tile that has liberated itself from the side of the ship and then is tumbling. And it's not just one. There's three, four, five tiles, it looks like, they're cascading off the bottom of the ship. So you want to scream failure, Everybody knows that SpaceX needs to know whether or not those tiles are going to stay attached. The space shuttle itself wasn't built in a day. I think we all know that. But launching this and seeing how the tiles were affected by the ignition, the rumbling of the rocket at liftoff, and the reflected sounds all around, and then getting through, Max Q, really getting through the sound barrier, whether or not their attachment system, that clipping sort of system that keeps those tiles attached, was going to work through those different phases of the flight was really important information for SpaceX to get. So you can't say it's a failure as long as they learn from it. Then here we are back to the camera at the, the top of the booster. I'm going to say, look how close the grid fin is to it here, right against the body of the rocket. Again, looking down, but look at the clouds in the background. You can see that this was an early morning launch because of sort of the shadows that are going in this direction. The sun rising in the east over there, out over the Gulf of Mexico. Not really drawn to scale there, but putting that sort of low angle light, casting those long shadows on the, the tops of the clouds, right? Also, look at the exhaust plume as well. You get this sort of golden color on the sunward side of the plume and then shadow on the back side of the plume. Shadows are really interesting. Shadows are really useful when looking at things, aerial photography, satellite photography, etc., etc. Also in this shot, you can see the curve of Boca Chica Beach there going all the way up to the jetties at the north. The ship channel actually goes in like this, and then there's Isla Blanca, there's the hotels. All right, and then we get into long range tracking footage. This one looks like it was coming from South Padre Island because the angle of the rocket. And look at this. There's still an engine out in the center core. We saw that on takeoff. But another thing you could really see from this angle is that Starship is not flying straight. Covered this in the analysis video as well, but take a look at the plume. You have this vent, that, I'm exaggerating a little bit so you can see it, but you have this vent that's sort of going like this. If the rocket was flying straight through the air, you would expect that vent to be going straight down the back of the rocket. But anyways, watch the other video if you're interested in that whole analysis. I won't put it here. The other video was like an hour long. <laughs> Here's another thing that's really obvious in this fantastic tracking footage. Look at this sort of like timed periodic spurting coming down the side. It seems like it's almost consistently timed, like spurt, 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 spurt. I really wonder what caused that consistent timing of those spurts happening. Of course, here we have the meme with the guy wearing his hat backwards, holding up his hand to shade the sun, <laughs> whatever. And then you can really visualize the trajectory when you get the, the plume behind the rocket, right? This big plume that's formed behind it, arcing off into the distance. But honestly, looking at this, it doesn't look that off nominal. We're so zoomed out from the rocket. A rocket leaning over to gain horizontal velocity instead of vertical velocity so that it can get that 17,500 miles per hour required to actually orbit the Earth as opposed to just fall back down again. In fact, if a rocket went straight up and didn't arc, I would say that's a problem. That rocket doesn't look like it's going the right way today. But uh, this doesn't look that off nominal. It's really when you zoom in and look at the body of the rocket that you're like, wait a second. If earlier you saw what seemed to be concern from Elon as he stood up to go look out the window, here, given the angle of his eyes and the grin on his face, it looks like the rocket has cleared the tower, hasn't destroyed the entire facility, and that is success. Just, just the lean back of relief all of a sudden, right? <laughs> 
Here we go back to the top of the booster cam. Interesting thing to see here, this is the shadow of the rocket plume, casting that long shadow along the cloud layer. But also down at the bottom of the rocket, <sighs> Things not looking too great. Typically, you know, we see the plume expansion on the Falcon 9s where the lower atmospheric density lets the plume sort of spread out to the side, right? But usually it still looks like an exhaust plume. It doesn't just look like burning flames coming out the side of the rocket. It's also picked up a little bit of a roll in this shot. In and of itself, not really troubling. Lots of rockets do rolls whenever they're taking off or whenever they're sort of getting into this part of their trajectory. But for Starship, it wasn't completely intentional, I don't think. And back to the tracking shot again. Here we can see that the angle of the vent, remember I talked about earlier the airflow making it sort of go off at an angle? It seems like the angle of that venting is a little bit more of an angle, meaning the rocket's flying a little bit more sidewards. But also, look at the engines down on the bottom. What's going on here in the middle? Do you see that little flickering light right in the middle? We know that one engine was completely off from the time that it launched, but this engine looks like it's, it's struggling to even create a flame. It's almost as if the, the engine's combustion has failed, but there's still methane leaking that's being ignited and causing a flame or, or some light there in the engine belt. And then over on the side as well, look at this. This seems to be a clear, massive leak. Now, is it methane that's leaking off the sign? Is it hydraulic fluid? I wouldn't think the rocket has that much hydraulic fluid in it, right? But something is leaking out of the bottom of the rocket and causing this huge, visible, orange, white, whatever you want to call it, plume. Even down here, we've already well crossed the border into over-analysis, right? But this one engine looks like it might be a little dimmer than the others. I mean, they all sort of have that halo effect on the lower right hand side but that one seems to be a smaller circle than the other engines okay now we're back on the forward flap cam and this is definitely not the way that rockets fly at this point you can see that it is yawing pitching whatever you want to say uncontrollably it's lost its attitude control and a tumble like this complete with the uh, airflow blowing the exhaust sideways almost as if it was a boost back burn but it wasn't a boost back burn it really doesn't look right and the tracking camera again. Here we really see that now one of the inner ring engines is struggling. Same sort of thing where we saw before where there's still a little light being generated in the middle, but it doesn't look like rocket thrust. It, it looks like, you know, leaking methane just continuing to uh, combust, but not really creating a lot of thrust. But it's all good. They cleared the pad. It doesn't seem to have destroyed the tower. So success for SpaceXers back here in Hawthorne again, <laughs> cheering the rocket on as it tumbles through the sky. Now, Again, they've, they've moved the camera up a little bit here. You can see the massive engine bell of the Vacuum Merlin up there, and this is the bottom of a Dragon spacecraft. You can also see the upper deck of the cafeteria where the clinking sounds from some of the webcasts actually come from. Some of the hosts are up there on occasion filming the webcast, and you hear silverware clattering behind the scenes. People gotta eat. Now, away from the factory, back to the tracking camera, and we've one two skipped a few here because the rocket has lost a lot of resolution. It's a lot further downrange, and there's a lot more air atmosphere between the camera and the rocket body. Ah, but why would SpaceX skip ahead like this? I mean, it's only a two minute video, but this seems to show the results of the flight termination system attempting to terminate the flight, but failing to do so in a timely manner. So all the way back up to the flap cam again, but couple very interesting things to see here. First off with an eye for the tiles, looks like we've lost quite a few more tiles here. I mean, you can see the hexagonal white areas, sort of indentions or shadows in some places where the ship has clearly lost some tiles. Now, I'm not going to scream about that too much because in this phase of the flight, the rocket has undergone a lot of attitude changes and a lot of forces, a lot of aerodynamic forces acting on the tiles that it wouldn't normally have experienced if it was flying straight on its way to orbit. I mean, it could have also been that the flight termination system has gone off at this point in the shockwave going through the vehicle of the charges intended to destroy it popped off a couple tiles. Now, sort of feeds you into the uh, structural margins were better than anticipated, but doesn't mean that the TPS system is a total failure. Certainly gives you some information that you can potentially use to improve it, though. But really, look at this down at the back of the rocket, right? You see these dark areas that are sort of like blocking the flames coming out the back? That looks like the body of the rocket actually bent outwards. 
Was it an explosion that liberated the side of the, the aft skirt? That's sort of near where the HPUs, the hydraulic power units are, but they're sort of like right in line underneath the fins. It seems more likely that an explosion that pushed, bent that material outwards, and then you see it sort of flapping in the airflow as the rocket tumbles uncontrolledly. Uncontrolledly? Is that a word? Whatever, tell me in the comments. Last time I said sidewards and people got on my case. Sideways. You knew what I meant. Rockets out of control. Flight termination system has attempted to terminate the flight. At some point, it's going to lose structural integrity like that. I mean, the crowd's here really like, what's going on? Is it going to blow up? Is it just going to crash into the ocean? <laughs> you got to thank SpaceX for releasing this one. I mean, the, the video pixelization seeming to imply that the impending loss of signal, right? These may very well be the last frames ever transmitted from this forward flap camera. Now, clearly the rockets come apart, but look in the explosion from this sort of zoomed in shot. Look at the chunks of rocket that are still there. How big are those? And in the fade out here, what is this? Is that like a, an internal part, like a downcome or something? Is it an unwrapped ring? Remember when they make these, they, they weld the rings, they weld the rolls of stainless steel into rings. Whatever it is, it's big. And then here at the end, SpaceX throwing us a bone, showing the rollout of Ship 25, confirming the next orbital flight attempt is going to be Booster 9 and Ship 25. Thanks, SpaceX. Also, you get the reflection off these uh, solar panels down here. Looks like it's pretty close to the NSF highway camera site. Anyways, I hope you thought that was interesting. I know some people are probably going to be up in arms in the comments. Oh, overanalyzing, milking it for all it's worth. Well, there were some interesting things that were visible in that footage that we hadn't seen before. We hadn't had that quality of footage before. So I thought we'd spend a little time just talking through it real quick. If you like the video, make sure you toss a little thumbs up to it down there to give me an excuse to keep doing these sorts of things. And we'll continue to watch the progression of Booster 9 and Ship 25 towards their own integrated flight campaign over on Starbase Live and all of our videos here on the channel. If it's the sort of thing you like, you know how to get back to the YouTube channel. Like and subscribe or whatever it is. So anyways, I'm John Galloway for NSF, and we'll see you nerds later.